Hey, this is Nicole Kelly, host of Loud and Proud. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Daniel Poppy, host of How to Write Good here on Public House Media. I just want to thank you for listening to the following broadcast brought to you by Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope that you'll come check out my show, How to Write Good, the writing show that is not about writing. A new show of How to Write Good comes up every Wednesday, so don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of How to Write Good. Again, thanks for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. The latest headlines. He's so much better as that number two option. The insightful interviews. Michael Scotto, basketball insiders. I don't think there's an Italian sit down between LeBron and Kyrie. The hottest takes. Teams that do run the system that Colin thrives in have starting quarterbacks. Can all be found on Press, Press Row. Row. Here's your host. You can only envy being that good ever in your life. Christian Heimel. Oh man, it's one of the best days of the year, one of the best weeks of the year, Thanksgiving week here on Press Row. Welcome everybody, happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. Christian Imel with you guys as part of the Public House Media Network. Don't forget you can find us on Facebook, Press Row Podcast dash Public House Media, Twitter and Instagram at Press Row PHM, email the show Press Row PHM at gmail.com. Check us out, subscribe, rate, review, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, and of course, as always, the phmedia.com. Got a fun show for you guys today. So happy you're spending part of your Thanksgiving holiday with us. Ryan Mayer, CBS Local Sports, will join us in just a little bit to talk college football, the coaching carousel, already moving in the world of college football. A lot of rumors, a lot of names being placed, and then, of course, the big game this weekend, the one that really can change the entire landscape of the college football playoff, Alabama and Auburn, the Iron Bowl, number one against number six. SEC West Championship potentially on the line. A trip, should Alabama lose this game, they probably will not go to the SEC title game, and the questions begin on if Alabama still has enough to make it into the college football playoff. Hall of Fame ballots are out for both Major League Baseball as well as the NFL. Uh, We'll touch on some MLB rumors and some interesting notes to make mention of in Major League Baseball. Some new rules potentially coming into play in 2018. And the hot stove is really starting to cook up in uh, the uh, Major League Baseball. But we'll begin today in the NFL where uh, some interesting things are going on. And you look at some of these teams, some of these players that are really starting to kind of uh, separate themselves. You're really seeing, and obviously we got three games today on Thanksgiving. Uh, Obviously, you've got the Giants and Redskins tonight, Cowboys and Chargers, and then Vikings and Lions. We'll touch on those three games in just a little bit, but you're starting to see some teams separate themselves, and the NFC has become really, really interesting because you've got four legitimate teams right now uh, that are, excuse me, five, I should say, that are really kind of scary here, and it's almost a toss-up. I know the Eagles have won eight in a row, nine and one, uh, after dismantling of the Cowboys, in which they scored 30, 30 points uh, in the second half to come away with a victory there uh, over Dallas and improve now to 4-0 and in the division, all but clinching the NFC East there. Uh, and it, nine and one, they're impressive as anything. The Vikings are interesting at 8-2. and two. Same with the Saints, uh, who have probably been the biggest surprise in the NFC at 8-2. and two. Panthers at 7-3. and three. And then the Los Angeles Rams at 7-3. and three. I don't think the NFC is as clear-cut for Philadelphia as I did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the Rams have really impressed me. The way they play, how fast they move, how big play, uh, their big play ability, I should say, is impressive. Their point differential is second best in the NFC. They're outscoring opponents by 117 this year um, combined. Again, 7-3, and 4-1 and one on the road, which is really difficult to do for a West Coast team, especially when you look at some of their road games. 
Uh, they've gone to Dallas and won a game. They've gone to Jacksonville. I know the Jags aren't great, but when you're going across country like that, a dismantling of the Giants, which isn't to say much this year, but still, again, to go across country like that and win those games is pretty important uh, for them. Yes, they squeaked by the Niners. Yes, they squeaked by the Cowboys. Um, but the biggest, the scariest thing for the Rams is this past week, the loss to the Vikings, 24-7. to So, who knows, but uh, listen, I like the Rams a lot. I'm all in on them. Um, I, I'm not saying they're going to win the Super Bowl, but they are definitely an intriguing team uh, to watch out for. And a big thing for them is the Seahawks. With that win on Monday night over Arizona at 6-4, and four, they stay alive, uh, especially now that they're 3-0 and oh in the division. Uh, Seattle, even with that defense being completely just obliterated with injuries like crazy and Cam Chancellor out for the year. Uh, This is a team in Seattle that has a chance to still win the division because they still have to play the Rams. Uh, And another victory, they already have a win over them. If they beat Los Angeles coming up in a few weeks, they will uh, probably win that division, which um, I know a lot of people had Seattle as a sneaky pick for the Super Bowl. Uh, Who knows? They may still get there. So, uh, what Russell Wilson has been doing this year is very impressive, especially considering how depleted that defense is. The fact that they really haven't had much of a running attack this year. He's been doing a very good job as a game manager and a game breaker, really, in some instances. So um, the NFC West is going to be a lot of fun to watch. The NFC South, though, I think is going to be the most exciting thing in the world because You've got a Carolina team at 7-3 and three with Greg Olson set to come back here shortly. They've got the Falcons nipping at their heels in the Panthers um, as Olsen probably going to come back this week. But you've got the Panthers with already a victory over the Falcons and the Buccaneers. Yes, they got blown out at home to the Saints in Week 3, but they're starting to figure things out. They're using Christian McCaffrey the right way. I know the, the trade... Um, with uh, Benjamin made it a little interesting there, and you wonder why they did it. But this is a team that is four and one on the road. And you look, I mean, the NFC South in general; these are teams that can win on the road, and you need those road wins when you get to the playoffs. You got New Orleans and Carolina each at four and one on the road. Atlanta at four and two, but the Falcons with that loss. Here's here's the only thing that can save the Falcons right now. They've still got five games left against the division. Five of their last six are against the division. So they can come away with a huge boost here. Uh, They've got the Buccaneers at home this weekend. Then it's against the Vikings next weekend, but that game's at home, so that's huge for them. Saints, Buccaneers, at the Saints, Panthers. So if Atlanta can find a way to maybe go 4-1 and in those divisional games these next six weeks, the rest of the stretch... Atlanta might be able to salvage something. I personally don't think they can. I think the Saints right now are the team to beat in the NFC. And I say that simply because the Saints are running the football very well. They're one of the top two running teams in the league, right behind the Philadelphia Eagles, um, which is insane to think of. So, And the fact that they've won eight straight. They're winning games on the road. They're doing it in different fashions. You look at the blowout victory at Buffalo two weeks ago, and then the comeback win where they scored 15 points in the matter of six minutes against the Redskins at home. That just shows you the defense that they have to be able to do that, and their ability to come back shows you that Drew Brees still has it going on. Uh, Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram are great uh, together especially. So much fun to watch. So the NFC South to me is going to be really interesting, but mainly because... Atlanta, again, five of their last six games are against divisional opponents. That is huge for Atlanta. Uh, And not to mention the fact that of those five games, I believe three of them are on the road, or three of them are home. Uh, So that's going to be what's really exciting to watch for the Falcons um, to see if they can do that. Uh, Actually, all four. Or, yes, three of them are at home. So you got the Buccaneers, the Saints, and the Panthers all at home. Um, you got to travel to New Orleans on Christmas Eve. That'll be tough, but the NFC South is going to be a lot of fun, folks. It really is. Uh, and then, of course, the Eagles at 9-1. and one, They've all but wrapped up the division. 
uh, in the NFC East. So nothing to really worry about there. The question is, is can the Cowboys do enough to get back into a wild card? And I don't really think so. Uh, the two wild card spots, it looks like, could come out of the NFC South, as we just mentioned with the Panthers and Falcons, or it could be the second place team in the South and the Seattle Seahawks if they don't sneak up and win the division against Los Angeles. So I don't see the Cowboys making the playoffs, uh, which you look at it, and I don't know if Jason Garrett should be on the hot seat because here's the thing. Jerry Jones is going to use the excuse of not having Ezekiel Elliott, the injury to Tyron Smith, their left tackle, the injury to Sean Lee. They're going to use a lot of excuses, but I don't understand Jason Garrett's play calling sometimes, even with out Ezekiel Elliott, you still have a great offensive line and you don't run the football. You can't put it all on Dak, um, but it, it'll be interesting to see. And the Cowboys, they can try to keep their season alive with a win today over the Los Angeles Chargers, but who knows? Um, so, And then the NFC North, there's a big game today. The, the, the biggest one, you may even be watching it right now as you're listening here, Minnesota and Detroit, because uh, if Minnesota can get a victory here at 9-2 and two and 3-1 and one in the NFC North, uh, they may have a chance. And splitting with the Lions, who already beat them earlier, they could essentially wrap up the division as well in the North. Meanwhile, Detroit, if they can get a victory, uh, they improved a 4-0 in the division in the North with a sweep of the Vikings. That's huge for them. That saves their season, essentially, and keeps them in the hunt for a playoff spot. Um the Vikings, Mike Zimmer did the right thing, keeping Case Keenum there. I've said it a couple of different times, said it last week. I believe Case Keenum should be the starting quarterback until he proves otherwise. Uh, Teddy Bridgewater, as great of a story as he is, he hasn't been on the football field in two years. So you need to get him back. There's a difference between football shape and game shape, and anybody will tell you that. So um, uh, this game's going to be a lot of fun to watch, maybe the most fun to watch on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, we'll take a quick look at the AFC because, listen, you, there are some decent teams, but uh, in my opinion, still, the Patriots are the runaway favorite in the AFC East simply because, and I know the Steelers are playing better, and I know they have the same record, but the Patriots have yet to really play their division. They're going to run through that division. Um, the Steelers at 3-0, and it's not a great AFC North, neither is the East, obviously, with the Pats. But the Patriots' defense is starting to come around. What we thought. Matt Patricia has finally got things working out uh, and doing well. But uh, this team, the way they're blowing people out, proves that Tom Brady still has it and is still the greatest quarterback in the game. And the defense is starting to come together. Look at their last four games. And they have given up a total of 44 points, 11 points a game in their last four wins. Um, And every single one has been by at least one possession. Uh, 33 to eight over the Raiders, 41, 16 on the road against Denver. Um, And then you've got the Dolphins at home this weekend on the road for the Bills and the Dolphins the next two weeks. The interesting one is going to be coming up December 17th when the Pats go on the road to take on Pittsburgh. That will show you a lot. It's probably an AFC Championship preview, but I also think what it does is it proves that the Patriots are still the dominant team in not just the AFC, but the NFL. So that will be interesting to watch. Still a couple weeks away. We'll see what happens. But the Pats undefeated on the road, 8-2, and two, winners of six in a row, and continuing to just be the New England Patriots. Um, I still I picked them as my Super Bowl winner uh, at the beginning of the year. And I stand by that still. I don't think, um, you know, anything changes. Um, Obviously, the Packers aren't going to be making it like I predicted as well. But a lot of that has to do with the Aaron Rodgers injury. So as you guys watch football today and this weekend, enjoy it. Um, You've got some interesting games coming up. Uh, Like I said, I think the biggest one is obviously Minnesota and Detroit today. I hope you guys are enjoying watching that if you are. Um, Other than that, there's really not that much excitement going on. I mean, it's interesting to see if Dallas can keep their playoff hopes alive. Uh, Doubtful. New Orleans and Los Angeles, that'll be fun. But after the Rams just lost to the Vikings, uh, I think the Saints are going to be able to come away with a big win there. So you guys enjoy the football this weekend. Uh, Obviously, Thanksgiving is a big part of football. We'll touch on a little bit more college football with Ryan Mayer here in just a little bit. But coming up uh, after the break, we're going to touch on 
Stay with the NFL. Hall of Fame semifinalists are out. We'll touch on who I think is in, and then we'll switch things over to baseball. Uh, Their Hall of Fame uh, list put out earlier this week. Who should be in? Who should be off the ballot? A couple other news and notes in Major League Baseball as well. The NBA, your fan questions as well, all coming up here in just a little bit. Listen to every episode and get the latest shows sent right to you. Subscribe to Press Row on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher.com. Or visit us online at www.thephmedia.com. This is Press Row with Christian Heimel, a public house media podcast. Stay with the NFL stuff here a little bit on Press Row as uh, the 2018 Hall of Fame semifinalists were announced uh, earlier this week in the NFL. Six first-year eligible players, uh, Rondé Barber, Steve Hutchinson, Ray Lewis, Brian Urlacher, Randy Moss, and Richard Seymour uh, among 27 semifinalists. Uh, 25 semifinalists provide... Uh, the list and all ties for 25th. So two uh, players tying there as well. Uh, Leroy Butler, Leslie O'Neill, Simeon Rice, and Everson Walls, uh, semifinalists for the first time also here. So 2018 semifinals, 25 players, 12 on offense, 13 defensive players, two coaches. Uh, the finalists, the list for the finalists uh, will be coming out in a, uh, a few months um, but this is uh, four and eight new members are going to get elected out of this 27. So at least four, at most eight, going to get inducted into the Hall of Fame. And, and as you look at it, there are a couple of interesting ones. The biggest ones to me that are interesting are in the wide receiving core because you've got some interesting wide receivers here. Isaac Bruce, the former Rams, great, 15 years in the league. Um, you look at him and he had something like, Over 1,000 catches, 15,000 yards, 91 touchdowns. Uh, Those are probably Hall of Fame numbers. Uh, And then Torrey Holt, 920 catches, 13,000 yards, 74 touchdowns in his career. Who knows uh, in a 10-year career if that's enough to be able to do it. And then you've got Heinz Ward down there. Heinz Ward, 1,000 catches even, 12,000 yards, 85 touchdowns. Randy Moss and Terrell Owens rounding out the wide receivers. You've got legitimately, uh, was that one, two, you got five, five wide receivers of these uh, players who should be Hall of Famers. The question is, when will they be? For guys like Torrey Holden, Isaac Bruce, this is their third year on the ballot. Um, for Heinz Ward, this is his second year. Uh, Randy Moss, his first year. Um, T.O. has been on the year on the ballot for three years now, and, and look, it, or should, yeah, three years now. Terrell Owens should be a Hall of Famer. Say what you will, but of the five wide receivers that are listed on here, he's got the most catches, the most yards, and the most touchdowns. He's got a hundred and or excuse me, second most touchdowns. He's got a hundred and fifty-three touchdowns. The only guy on the list who's got more than him is Randy Moss with three. I don't care what you think about his antics. He legitimately is a Hall of Fame player. At his peak, there was nobody more dangerous than Terrell Owens on the outside. Whether it was in Philly, where he almost won a Super Bowl on a broken leg, remind you. If that leg had been healthy, Philadelphia probably wins a Super Bowl with Donovan McNabb, and then this isn't even a conversation. In Dallas, in San Francisco, wherever he played, his antics doing sit-ups in his driveway while Drew Rosenhaus takes questions, whatever they are, he was one of the most fearsome wide receivers. Randy Moss is a first ballot Hall of Famer because, in my opinion, when a term is coined because of you, you got mossed, where it's jumping over a defender to make a catch back in front because of how freakishly athletic and long he was, that is first ballot Hall of Fame worthy. 
But because of Terrell Owens' antics, and Randy Moss had some of those straight cash, homie, mooning Packers fans as he left, that may keep him out of the Hall of Fame this year. Terrell Owens and Randy Moss should be in the Hall of Fame this year, in 2018. I feel like Isaac Bruce should. His numbers say it. Super Bowl champion as well. 15 years, over 15,000 receiving yards. 91 touchdowns. Is Heinz Ward a Hall of Famer? Maybe not yet, but eventually, yes. You know, same with Torrey Holt. Torrey Holt, seven Pro Bowlers, seven Pro Bowls, um, 75, 74 touchdowns, 13,000 yards. Yeah. Those five wide receivers are all Hall of Famers, but Terrell Owens and Randy Moss should be in right now. If nothing more, if their numbers don't prove it, combined, combined, these guys have 309 touchdowns, over 31,000 receiving yards, and over 2,000 catches. Combined. In 14 years for Randy Moss, yeah, 14 years each. Randy Moss, six-time Pro Bowler. Terrell Owens, six-time Pro Bowler. Moss was a four-time All-Pro first-teamer. Terrell Owens, a five-time All-Pro first-teamer. These guys are Hall of Famers. So at some point, we need to stop. And this goes across the board in Hall of Fame selections. I understand it's a character clause for Major League Baseball. But you're off-the-field stuff. You can be a Hall of Fame person and a Hall of Fame player. You can be a Hall of Fame player and a terrible person. No offense to Babe Ruth, but the dude smoked more cigarettes, drank more alcohol, but he's one of the greatest baseball players of all time, and he's revered. Revered. Why are Randy Moss and Terrell Owens not Hall of Famers? Just because you didn't like their personality? It's not about that. The Hall of Fame is about numbers. These guys put up incredible numbers and they transcended the game. When you're recognized by just one, by two silo, two letters, T-O, Terrell Owens, that is a Hall of Famer. When you have a phrase or a terminology named after you, you got mossed, that's a Hall of Famer right there. Those two guys should be in the Hall of Fame. I look up and down the rest of this. Uh, Bobby Bethard could be a fun story for for the executive to go in there. Um, I'm looking up and down the rest of this. Roger Craig, I don't know if he is a Hall of Famer. He's been on the ballot, um, you know, now nearly ten or twenty years. Um, The running former running back, over eight thousand rushing yards. I don't think that's Hall of Fame worthy. Brian Dawkins is interesting. Uh, Brian Dawkins, a Nine-time Pro Bowler, four-time first-team All-Pro defensive back, one of the toughest guys there. Uh, Alan Fanica is another one who probably should be up there uh, in the Hall of Fame in that rarefied era. Edron James is an interesting case this year. You know, I love watching Edron James play. 12,000 rushing yards, 80 touchdowns. He's a Hall of Famer. He is. The question is, is when will he get in? Other first ballot guys, Ray Lewis, first ballot Hall of Famer. Brian Erlacher, first ballot Hall of Famer. For similar reasons of of T.O. and Randy Moss, those guys were the best at their position and they changed, I don't want to say changed the game, but transcended the game. I'm looking at these guys and, and even Richard Seymour, I don't know if he's a first ballot Hall of Famer, but he's a Hall of Famer. There are guys on this list that just make sense to you. Simeon Rice is not a Hall of Famer. He's not, I'm sorry. If you're a Simeon Rice fan. Ty Law, maybe, yeah. Kevin Mawai, I know a lot of Jets fans will be upset, but I don't think he's a Hall of Famer. I know only eight guys at most are going to get in, but I'm looking at, let's see, Steve Atwater, first ballot Hall of Famer. Isaac Bruce should get in. Brian Dawkins should get in. Edron James, Ray Lewis, Randy Moss, T.O. and Brian Urlacher. If you're going to put in eight guys, those are the eight, in my opinion. Because Steve Atwater was awesome. He was great. Only played for 10 years, but eight-time Pro Bowler. Spent 11 years as the number one defensive back for his teams. 
He was fun. He was cool. You look at him and and I just, yeah. I mean, he's a Hall of Famer to me. So those are my eight. I mean, Steve Atwater, Isaac Bruce, Brian Dawkins, Edron James, Ray Lewis, Randy Moss, Terrell Owens, Brian Erlacher. I like Torrey Holt a lot. I think he gets in. Same with Heinz Ward, but not this year. So we'll see what happens when the list comes out in a little bit uh, in a couple months and see exactly what happens. Um, February 3rd, day before the Super Bowl, uh, is when the selection committee gets their votes in for the Hall of Fame. Obviously, we'll have a finalist list before that as well. Other Hall of Fame list announced was uh, Major League Baseball. They announced their Hall of Fame list earlier this week and take a look at some of the first time, first ballot Hall of Famers. There are a lot of them. Uh, 19 first time Hall of Fame, first ballot uh, guys, and only maybe three of them are first ballot Hall of Famers, in my opinion. But you look up and down there, there's some exciting. Chipper Jones is a first ballot Hall of Famer, no doubt in my mind. Uh, Jim Tomey is an interesting guy. He's eighth all time in home runs. He has 612 home runs. He's up there in terms of, uh, he's up there in, in RBI as well. Uh, Scott Rowland. I don't, I love Scott Rowland. Love watching him play, uh, especially defensively. And, And that's the thing. We're in a time now where we care so much about offense. Will defense get you in for Scott Rowland and Andrew Jones, who's also on the ballot for the first time. Those are two. Uh, guys that probably should be Hall of Famers, if anything, based off their defense. So um, Andrew Jones, wow, 152 stolen bases, almost 900 walks. Problem is, is he couldn't figure it out later in his career, and his career batting average is only 254. So that's that's gonna be a little tough to to do. But Chipper Jones is a first ballot Hall of Famer, 300, 303 career batting average, um, 468 homers. One of the best third basemen of all time. Uh, easy first ballot Hall of Famer. Omar Vizquel, another one just a defensive wizard. Uh, 400 stolen bases, 272 batting average. Only hit 80 homers, but he was just incredible to watch. If you really care about war, uh, 45.3 wins above replacement for him. Played 24 years in the game. Tremendous. Um First, other first ballot guys, first times on the ballot: Johnny Damon, Johan Santana, Carlos Zambrano, Levon Hernandez, uh, El Duque, Orlando Hudson. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Levon's uh, El Duque's brother, Levon Hernandez. Uh, Kerry Wood. You know, Kerry's interesting because if he hadn't gotten hurt, if he hadn't you know kind of come off the radar, he was dominant at one point. He really was. You look at his strikeout numbers, and they are impressive. Over 1,500 strikeouts, 1,582 strikeouts in 14 years. I mean, I know he struggled a lot, but he was uh, he was a lot of fun to watch. He was interesting. Really, really was interesting there. Um, reliever, starter as well. But from a first ballot standpoint, I think there's only two guys that go in this year. First ballot, Chipper Jones and Jim Tomey. Scott Rowland, Andrew Jones should be going in. Um, whether Carlos Zambrano or Johan Santana go in is going to be tough. Johan, because of the injury. Carlos, because I don't think he really kept it up much of his career, especially late. Um, so we'll we'll see what happens with those guys. Same with Kerry Wood. Brad Lidge is, is also pretty interesting. Brad Lidge is a guy um, with a little under 800 strikeouts, but his save numbers were impressive. Uh, and... He was a great reliever for the Astros all those years and a little bit in Philly as well. Um, other than that, I mean, Trevor Hoffman should go in this year in his third year. Vlad Guerrero is going to go in. Edgar Martinez should be in the Hall of Fame. I don't know why he's not, and this is his ninth year on the ballot, so he better go in this year. Um, and then we'll see what happens with guys like Roger and, and Barry. The fact that both of them are over 50% is pretty interesting. Um and eventually those guys will be Hall of Famers, I think. Kurt Schilling is another interesting one, uh, another guy who his off-field stuff after he's retired may keep him out of the Hall of Fame, whether you agree with it or not. But Kurt Schilling, 270 wins, a 368 lifetime average, uh, 
couple World Series, and yeah, one of the better postseason pitchers of all time. Excuse me, that's Mike Mussina, 270 wins. Uh, Kurt Schilling, 216 career wins and a 346 ERA. But when you look at the postseason, Mussina and Schilling both were were pretty good uh, in their opportunities. So I know baseball allows 10 guys on the list, or 10 guys to get in. You're going to have Chipper Jones, Jim Tomei, Trevor Hoffman, Vlad Guerrero, and Edgar Martinez. It may be just those five. But if it's just those five, that's that's a great five to have. The more interesting thing will be where Clemens, Bonds, Manny Ramirez, and Kurt Schilling, where their numbers are when all is said and done. A couple other news and notes in Major League Baseball. We'll get to that after we talk to Ryan Mayer, CBS Local Sports. He's coming up in just a little bit, as are your questions uh, as well here on Press Row. Want to be part of the show? Go to Facebook and search Press Row Podcast dash Public House Media. Or find us on Twitter and Instagram at Press Row PHM. You can also email the program Press Row PHM at gmail.com. This is Press Row with Christian Heimel, a Public House Media podcast. Well, not a lot of juicy matchups this weekend in college football to borrow a, uh, a Thanksgiving pun here on Press Row. But you do have uh, Clemson and uh, South Carolina on the road. And then, of course, the big one, uh, Auburn and Alabama, the Iron Bowl, number one versus number six coming up on Saturday. Not much on the field, but a lot of stuff to talk about on the field. And to help us with that, Ryan Mayer of CBS Local Sports, we bring him back onto the show. And Ryan, uh, I don't know if we've ever had a coaching carousel this active this early in the season. Yeah, it's certainly uh, been a wild one so far, especially when we had two top programs in the SEC, or well, I should say two historical programs in the SEC, uh, in Tennessee and Florida, letting go of their coaches. And then on top of that, you have a UCLA team and dropping Jim Mora over the course of this week. So it's a lot of high profile jobs coming open and it's going to be interesting to see how this thing uh, all spins itself out because, as we know, this is just the beginning of the uh, of the jobs that will come open. There will be guys that are brought in that have to then be replaced at their schools uh, once they come into these jobs. So it's it's starting up hot and heavy early this year. The, the UCLA thing, it, you start the season top 25, you've got a, a Heisman candidate at quarterback, a, a number one overall pick candidate, at quarterback, it felt like this shouldn't have happened. What, where did enough become enough with uh, with Jim Mora? I think the biggest thing at UCLA has just been the lack of a, of a defense. Really, I, I mean, it's it's when you're running out a guy like a Josh Rosen, who is, as you said, going, a potential number one overall pick in the NFL draft. That should be enough to win you eight games in college football right now the UCLA is teetering on the border of bowl eligible I mean that's not where you're supposed to be when you have one of those transcendent talents and the largest problem has been the fact that Rosen's had to put up ridiculous numbers every game just to have the Bruins in the game the defense since Miles Jack and uh, Eddie Vanderdoss got hurt a couple of seasons ago now I think three years ago uh, if, if my math is correct one, uh, once those guys got hurt that season the defense has just steadily uh, declined and been downhill and yeah the first win of the season was great they got down big to Texas A&M but then Rosen leads them all the way back and they get the victory but the fact that they were down that much to Texas A&M in the first place should have been our first troubling sign with this team and it's only continued throughout the course of the season and I think that's why eventually they had to make that move. Three big jobs that we know of right now, Ryan, that are open, obviously, uh, Tennessee, UCLA, and Florida. I want to touch on UCLA and Florida because Chip Kelly has been tied to both of them, met with Florida, has met with UCLA now, and it felt last week like Florida was a done deal, uh, but now, at least to me, it kind of feels like UCLA is where Chip Kelly's going to end up. Yeah, well, it's it's going to be played out here over the next couple of days, according to the most recent reports that I've seen uh, from Mark Slayball and uh, George Schroeder of ESPN and USA Today, respectively. Those guys um, have said that Kelly basically has standing offers from both UCLA and Florida. He met with UCLA on Tuesday to talk over the specifics of the job and everything along those lines. 
and he's going to be making up his mind here in the next couple of days. It's interesting with Kelly, and he's obviously one of the hottest names in college in college coaching since his stint in the NFL hasn't didn't work out, I should say, uh, with the Philadelphia Eagles and then the San Francisco 49ers. He was brilliant at Oregon, 46 and seven during the course of his time there, basically a field goal away from a national championship. So you understand the interest from these two programs. I just wonder now in today's day and age where a lot of schools are using this same similar style of up-tempo, spread-out offense, how effective – I mean, not to say that he won't be effective, but how much he'll catch opponents off guard. A lot of the times at Oregon, it it was tough to face them because you just – you weren't used to seeing what they were doing. Now so many teams run this this spread-up tempo style that – it's going to be interesting to see what Kelly does and what innovations he brings back to the college game with him now that he's had a little bit of time away from the game. But, but, but Ryan, I mean, how much does the Will Lyles case affect, uh, or should it even affect, Chip Kelly's potential hiring at any of these uh, places? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a big question, right? Because it, it's something that is looming over his head from the NCAA. You don't know um, what exactly the penalty might be uh, from the NCAA if there is one in that case. And I mean, I don't know that you can just say, all right, we're not going to, we're not going to bring this guy in because he's the level of coach where you, you have to take a chance on him. Now, I, I, the good news is with that entire case, I don't know that it's going to be a huge penalty uh, from the NCAA if there were to be one again. Uh, but it is it is certainly a factor to consider, but I just I I can't see a school looking at Kelly and saying, you know what, because of that whole situation, we're not going to bring him in. Especially these two schools in particular, in UCLA and Florida, who are looking for that big name hire right now to really re-energize the, that those fan bases. I mean, Christian, I've been watching Florida Twitter work itself into a blather, as I'm sure you have over the past two weeks now, like flight tracking flights coming out of Bristol, out of New Hampshire truthering, you know, what planes are on the tarmac in Gainesville. I mean, it's it, it's circa LeBron James' decision in 2014. It's the same sort of idea right now with this Florida fan base. They want him bad, and I can't imagine that um, anything that would come down in the Will Files case is going to keep either Florida or UCLA from, from bringing him in. Scott Frost is an interesting name, and we're speaking with uh, Ryan Mayer of CBS Local Sports here on Press Row. Uh, obviously great couple seasons at UCF, um, but in, in, even though his alma mater, Nebraska, doesn't have a coaching vacancy yet, it feels like uh, they're going to and that they're going to make a hard push for Scott Frost, who won a national title with them as a quarterback 20 years ago. But then again, just up the road in Gainesville, you know the Gators are going to really give a look to a guy who knows how to recruit in Florida, too. Yeah, Frost has definitely got to be on the radar at Florida as well. I imagine Kelly ends up saying no to the Gators and uh, ends up picking the Bruins that it'll probably be Frost that is next on that speed dial uh, for the for the folks down there at Florida. He, you said it. He came into UCF. That was an 0-12 program the year before he got there when George Leary stepped down. He comes in, turns them around to a bowl team last year, now has them undefeated with the potential of if they beat South Florida this Friday – then go on to the American Conference Championship game and possibly a New Year's Six Bowl bid. That is a remarkable turnaround. Granted, Central Florida is a very solidly positioned school. It's right in the middle of that recruiting hotbed that is the state of Florida. But he's done a fantastic job with a lot of the guys that were already in this program. It's not like he's had a ton of time to bring in his own recruits and everything like that, considering he's just been there for two years. He, he's a hot name on this coaching carousel. I'm sure Nebraska fans want him. Nebraska fans have been waiting for that coaching savior now for a while since they've been fed up with the last couple of years of Bill Pelini's regime and now in the Mike Riley one as well. Nebraska, the only thing I wonder about, though, is whether or not uh, that is still going to be considered. I know it's his alma mater, whether or not it's still going to be considered in his mind that top tier level of job. I mean, it's an easier path than Florida, I, I would say, because of the Big Ten West, you really only have Wisconsin and Iowa here and there. Outside of that, it's 
you know, how good is that job? It, it's it's tough to recruit there. Nebraska is not exactly a state that is known for having top-level recruits, and you're going to have to have those recruiting pipelines outside the state to bring guys in for the Cornhuskers. Oh, they want them bad over there uh, in in Lincoln. So uh, one last coaching vacancy I want to touch on before we get to, to the actual on-field stuff. Tennessee um, waited too long, in a lot of people's opinion, to fire Butch Jones, but now it feels as though it's John Gruden. And, and some of these rumors may be coming from John Gruden himself, but we've seen this before as a dance to kind of get more out of ESPN with the Monday Night Football gig. How likely do you think it is that Gruden not only makes a return to coaching, but actually goes to college football? Man, at at this point, I just I can't see him leaving the Monday Night Football booth. He he's been out of the game for so out of the coaching game for so long now. Not to say that he can't coach anymore. I, of course, he could still come back and he could probably turn Tennessee around. But do I do I see him leaving the comforts of that Monday Night Football job where he's not consistently dealing with boosters on a week to week basis, where he's not having to hit the ground and recruit these kids throughout the country and, and all that all the stuff that comes with being a college head coach these days, I just I don't see him leaving the booth. In Tennessee's fan, fans' minds, though, if they, their perfect scenario is getting Gruden and then bringing in Peyton Manning as the offensive coordinator. Like, that is their dream scenario. Do I see that happening? No. Is it interesting to continue to see Gruden's name come up in the coaching carousel moments every year? Absolutely. I honestly expect him more to lean towards a pro job than I would a college one, but maybe that's just me. I, I just I don't see him leaving that job that he has right now for the college level where it's not more difficult than the NFL, but there there's plenty of balls in the air in college that pro coaches don't necessarily have to deal with. He's Ryan Mayer, CBS Local Sports, joining us here. Let's talk about some stuff that we actually know of uh, as opposed to all speculation with coaches. Uh, Oklahoma, Kansas this past weekend, the non-handshake, the gesture by Baker Mayfield. Um, Mayfield obviously won't start on senior day. He's also been stripped of his captaincy. Uh, you saw his emotional apology, not being able to be captain in his final home game of his career. Uh, and then... Kansas, it was announced that the three players who refused to shake his hand also had their captaincy status revoked. Have we gone too far with all of this? Well, of course it's gone too far, but we live in the day and age of, of reactionary you know, Twitter mobs and when things get out of hand the way that they did. But by all means, absolutely, Baker Mayfield crossed the line with his actions on the field against Kansas. But you know, that was born of multiple things. It wasn't just the handshake prior to the game. There were some late hits in that game that Kansas play, uh, players took at Baker Mayfield. So he just got fed up to the point where the competitiveness overtook him. He went way out of line with what he did. He apologized for it. Do I agree with him not starting the game? Absolutely. The captaincy thing, though, I mean, this is the kid's last home game. I, this This is the last time that, you know, he gets – the opportunity to be in front of those fans and be kind of appreciated by those fans prior to the game as one of the captains. He's announced as, as such. And, I mean, it's tough. I understand where Lincoln Riley is coming from in that respect of, of what he did, making sure the penalty seems harsh enough uh, for Mayfield's actions. But it's certainly something that I feel like we've just kind of spiraled out of control a little bit here. Yes, I'm all for sportsmanship. Yes, both sides were clearly wrong here. Kansas, what are you doing? Just shake the dude's hand. At the same time, it's a handshake. Whether it goes down or not before the game doesn't affect anything. It's the play that happened out on the field afterwards, and, well, Mayfield, as we expected, lit Kansas up. I, it's it, it's a situation where, you know, yes, there, there, were, there were a lot of wrong things. No, you don't want to necessarily allow those things to go unpunished because, as we say all the time, you want to set the example for the next generation. But stripping of captaincies is something where we just we, we're so far down the rabbit hole at this point. I don't know. I don't, I don't know where we are. I've heard a lot of people make note that, that this is going to hurt him when it comes time for interviews. Uh, with NFL GMs at the Combine, but Baker Mayfield is going to win the Heisman Trophy. He may win a national championship. 
his style of play, I think he's the best player. I think he's the best quarterback. Uh, I think he should be the first quarterback drafted. But it does this kind of stuff, what happened with Kansas over the weekend, does this hurt him with NFL GMs? I don't know that it's going to hurt him as much as, I don't know that this specific incident is going to hurt him as much as it may be a combination of things that GMs are looking at and saying, "Eh, do we really want to bring this guy in? Because not only do you have this, you also have uh, video from over the course of the summer uh, of the arrest where he's running away from the cops and that whole situation. You know, it's really just there's that combination of things where you'll have some GMs that are flat out like, no, we're not taking them. At the same time, I agree with you. The, the biggest thing that I love about Baker Mayfield is that competitiveness, is that fire that he plays with on the field. And if I'm an NFL GM, am I, am I looking at that and saying, no, I'm not going to draft him? No, I'm more likely looking at that and saying, okay, we get him in the building and say, listen, don't do any of that crap on our sidelines, but bring that intensity when you're playing out on the field because that kind of mindset, that leap you mindset, I'm going to go out here and light you up, is exactly what I want from a quarterback. Mayfield has really stunned a lot of people this year um, with what he's done and not necessarily his overall numbers, but how he's put up those numbers. He's really done a nice job developing as, as a quarterback. And I think has gone from a guy that previous prior to the year, you probably would have said, okay, second, third uh, round type of guy to, yeah. I mean, he's, he's in the conversation now as one of the top quarterbacks in this class because of his performance and also because, of some of the poor performances we've seen out of the other guys. It's it's something that for, for NFL GMs they'll certainly ask about, I would imagine, but I don't know that it takes him off the board by any stretch. Well, we'll see what happens with Baker, a guy who I just uh, I, I love him. I can't get enough of Baker Mayfield. But, uh, Ryan, as, as we mentioned uh, before we brought you on here, not a lot of big, exciting matchups this weekend, but the Iron Bowl, the big one, Alabama and Auburn. Uh, Auburn, a chance to really – really shake things up and they've really kind of shut me up here over the week, uh, over the course of the season with how well they've played. Uh, how much of a chance do you give Auburn against Alabama and how much would it really shake things up if the Tigers pull off the win? Well, it would certainly shake things up if they come away with a win. There's no doubt about that. Alabama's the number one team in the country. Auburn wins this game. Alabama clearly drops from that point and it becomes a question of how many other teams lose either this week or next week in the championship games as to whether the tide get in. We did see last year Ohio State get in despite not winning their conference title and having that one loss. I don't know if the committee does that two years in a row. It'll be interesting if that scenario plays out. However, having said all of that, uh, I spoke this week to uh, Randy Cross of CBS Sports, one of the college football analysts here, about this game in particular and asked him really, you know, what what needs to happen for Auburn to win this game. And the main thing he said was they're going to need help from Alabama. And what he means by that is basically you're going to have to see the same sort of, you know, late game loss of focus, loss of concentration that the Tide really had in that national championship game on the last drive from Clemson where they're just down, they've been going up and down the field all game, and Auburn's got a chance late and they end up punching one in, or they turn the for a couple of times. Those are the types of things that are, are going to need to happen for Auburn to come out and win this game because Alabama, despite the fact that they do have a depleted linebacking corps right now, they don't have three starters um, in that unit, they're still bringing just a talent level that is superior to Auburn. It, there's there's just no question about it. The way that Nick Saban recruits, the, the way that he coaches and develops players, their talent is superior. It's a matter of whether or not Auburn is able to force some of those mistakes that the Tide don't usually make. The one thing with Alabama this year that I think I've been most impressed by is the late game play from Jalen Hurts. That Mississippi State drive, at the end, that game, I, I should say, at Mississippi State, where he, on the last drive, completed consecutive passes, to Calvin Ridley to put them in a position to, to Calvin Ridley and then the touchdown pass late in the game to put them in the position to win the game were two of the best passes that I've seen him throw in the course of his college career. And it's the kind of poise and calm that Alabama, I don't know that they've really had at the quarterback position combined with his playmaking ability during the course of Saban's time there. They've had, 
some solid quarterbacks, but what one of those previous tied guys would you look at and say, you know what, this kid's a problem. Like, we need to game plan for him. That's what Jalen Hurts brings to the table. I'm impressed by Auburn as well. What they did to Georgia was just insane on the Plains. And the last time we saw this game with SEC West implications on the Plains, we got to kick six. I don't think Nick Saban's going to be kicking a late game 50-some-odd-yard field goal to try and win this one. I think he learned from that the last time that he was down at Auburn. But I just – they're going to need some mistakes from Alabama to win this game. It's not that they don't have a shot. They can certainly win it. But they're going to, they're going to need some help, uh, as Randy said, from the time in order to get this win. Ryan Mayer, CBS Local Sports. As always, we appreciate the time, pal. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, man. That's Ryan Mayer. Listen, I mean, there's there's not much going on in the way of college football this weekend, but you got to watch the Iron Bowl uh, no matter what. And, and I'll be the first to admit it. I've been wrong about Auburn this year. I did not expect them to be in this position. Um, a win on Saturday puts them in the SEC title game because they'd have the tiebreaker over Alabama, and they would play Georgia. And Auburn's got a chance to play their way into the college football playoff, maybe knock Bama out. Um, you know, we touched on a couple of other things there and, uh, it just feels to me like the whole Baker Mayfield thing. I mean, listen, the guy's got passion. And at one point in time, that was a great thing to have. Yeah. You may upset some people, but you know what? So what? You've got that kind of edge, that chip on your shoulder. If you can back it up, go do it. You know, it's what we love about Mixed martial arts are boxing when two guys just stare at each other. They don't touch gloves before. It's it's what we love about the NBA when when a guy dunks on someone and just stares you down afterwards. Or bat flips in baseball. These are the type of things, the competitive edge, that mentality that we love. And I don't know why we get upset about it when a college kid, uh, maybe let's get the best of them. No, it's not what you want to see. It's not how you want your program represented. But you know what? Your program's going to be remembered for wins and national championships, not because of that. So I think we've become a little too sensitive with it. I love Baker Mayfield. I would want him on my team as my quarterback. I think his ability to scramble, his arm, his gunslinger mentality. Uh, it may not be the best arm in the world, but but damn, is it accurate. And man, is he fun to watch. And that that kind of mindset, that attracts people to follow him. And uh, And it'll be real easy for him to take command of a locker room as a quarterback when he gets into the NFL next year. Be a lot of fun to watch. Your questions and uh, 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 touch on the end of a career that should be recognized uh, for everything that the person was as opposed to the athlete he was. Coming up on Press Row. Want to be part of the show? Go to Facebook and search Press Row Podcast dash Public House Media. Or find us on Twitter and Instagram at Press Row PHM. You can also email the program, Press Row PHM at gmail.com. This is Press Row with Christian Heimel, a public house media podcast. I got my shades on top back, rolling with the music jack one on the Final segment on Press Row here this Thanksgiving week. Again, we thank you guys so much for making us a part of your holiday weekend, however and wherever you may be listening. Uh, you can always catch us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher.com. Don't forget to check out the website, thephmedia.com. Uh, time to answer some of your questions, and you fans can always, and listeners can always, uh, send them to us. And we love your support on social media, making us one of the fastest-growing sports podcasts in the country Press Row Podcast dash Public House Media. That's the Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram handle at Press Row PHM, or you can email us Press Row PHM at gmail.com. Eric in Wisconsin asking about the hot stove and the Milwaukee Brewers, who they should be going after, and can they actually go and get Jake Arietta? Listen, uh, the fact that Arietta declined his qualifying offer shows you a lot. Um, he wants another opportunity to win a World Series. I still think his best chance, at least in that division, is the Cubs. But if you've got money to spend and the Brewers are going to have that, um, I know that they want Arietta. I don't know if they get it. Uh, they need some good pitching because that's going to be the difference. They, they surprise a lot of teams with their offense, but they need pitching here 
if they're going to really make a run at it. And Arietta seems to be the guy. Uh, Lance Lynn would be an interesting one as well. Um, we'll see what happens. It, it, again, a lot of this is based off of, though, and, and here's the interesting part. A lot of what you're going to see here, and, and I think we're going to wait for two big dominoes to fall in the MLB hot stove. The first one is Giancarlo Stanton, and where does he go? I know the Cardinals have already put out a feeler for him and, and an actual official uh, trade proposal to the Marlins to get him. Um, and But we'll see. I know the Red Sox apparently want him. I, my issue with the Red Sox getting Giancarlo Stanton is who do you give up for him? Um, if it's Jackie Bradley Jr. and a couple of, of younger arms, then fine because Giancarlo can play left field um, and you can put Mookie over there in center. Uh, or I'm sorry, Giancarlo can play right field, you can put Mookie in center and leave Benintendi in left. Um, but uh, that's the first domino to fall is where is Giancarlo Stanton because that will kind of set the bar for trades. And as much as the Brewers may try to sign a Jake Arrieta or a Lance Lynn, Going out and trading for someone would be pretty important as well, uh, and they might be able to do that because they do have a talented farm system and some some pieces there to make things interesting. So what David Stearns does uh, in Milwaukee will be pretty interesting to find out. The second piece that I think is really interesting to watch here with this hot stove and, and, and kind of wrap your head around what may happen and who may go where is uh, Shohei Otana, uh, Otani, excuse me, the the Japanese two way player because. They've just now reached a, a new agreement on the posting system, a uh, tentative agreement, uh, should say. Uh, Players Union and the Nippon Professional Baseball League have reached a tentative agreement on a posting season, uh, include this offseason and continue the next couple of years. It's yet to be ratified, but uh, Shohei Otana will be formally posted on December 1st. And here's what happens. There's a posting fee, number one, that his team... In uh, in Japan, uh, Cebu, the Cebu Lions, um, they'll there'll be a posting fee that you can bid up for the right to negotiate with him. Once that bid is chosen, once that team is chosen, then the team has to go out and sign him. So this can be a pretty expensive thing for whoever it is. Uh, and this is a guy who can hit incredibly well while also pitching tremendously. Uh, so uh, what's interesting to note about this is who's going to be there because we've seen this with Daisuke Matsuzaka. We've seen it with Yu Darvish. We've seen it with, um, Masahiro Tanaka of all who is going to be there. Um, so it's a, it's, he'll be posted on the, on December 1st or excuse me, December 2nd. And then teams have until the 23rd to try to get a deal done with him, um, so three weeks, basically, and it's going to be rapid fire. And again, we're, we're pretty excited. We're going to be at the winter meetings in Orlando, December 10th through the 17th. And a lot of things may happen there. So, And we'll be right there. If anything breaks, uh, we'll be happy to bring it to you guys uh, as part of maybe Facebook Live or something like that when it happens down there. Um, and so with the new posting agreement, the team gets a percentage of the contract's total value. Uh, if it's a $50 million or more contract, then that club, the Cebu Lions, would get uh, 15% of the contract. If it's $25 million or less, Cebu gets a 20% cut of the total value of the contract, uh, 25 to $50 million, 17 and a half. So that's the interesting part. We'll see what happens. But again, this is a player who can play both ways. He can hit and he can pitch. Uh, you look at some of his stats from the Japanese league as a pitcher in five years. And he's only 22. Remember this, that he is 22 years old. He'll turn 23. Or excuse me, he's 23 years old. Uh, just turned 23 in July. In five years as a pitcher, 42 and 15 with a ERA of 252. Now this past year, he only started five games, but he had a complete game shutout a 3.20 ERA and a strikeout to walk ratio, 29 strikeouts, a whip of 1.2. Uh, where teams are really excited about him is his ability to hit because he can play in the outfield. And in five years, playing all three, excuse me, playing the corner outfield positions, left field 
and right field in all five years. He has combined 48 homers, uh, 166 RBI, and a 286 batting average. Now, he played about half the season this year. Uh, eight homers, 332 average, and 31 RBI. So the biggest thing about him is will he pitch, will he hit, will he try to do both, and who's going to spend the money to go and get him. So before we start figuring out where some of these smaller guys like Arietta or Lance Lynn or uh, Zach Cozart all end up going on the free agent market, John Carlos Stanton needs to be traded if he's going to get traded, and Shohei Otani needs to be uh, figured out where he's going to end up going. So we'll find out what happens with all that, obviously, in the next couple of weeks uh, with the winter meetings uh, as well. Um, Michael in Boston wants to know, with the Celtics having beaten the Warriors last week, by the way, which I told you guys they were going to do because defensively they're just a better team, are they the team to beat not just in the East but in the NBA? Um, no, uh, simply because it's one game against Golden State and you still would have to beat them four times and it would be very tough to do that. But uh, with this team and their winning streak, um, it's been tremendous to watch. But as we saw with Cleveland Indians this summer, no matter your winning streak, it doesn't mean anything. And we saw this with the Warriors a couple of years ago. You can break the all-time wins record, but if you don't win a championship, it doesn't mean anything. So it's it's kind of uh, a yes-no answer because they're the best team in the NBA right now. They're playing like the best team in the NBA. They've got the confidence and the swagger of the best team, especially with how young they are. Marcus Smart, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Kyrie Irving, all three of the, all four of those guys are incredibly young. Al Horford in that starting five, he's, he's the oldest guy there. But you look at the age here of these guys. Jalen Brown, 21. Kyrie Irving, 25. Marcus Smart, 23. Jason Tatum, 19. Al Horford at 31. That five is Marcus Morris at 28. I love Shane Larkin um, as uh, and Terry Rozier. Those guys, 25 and 23, respectively. You've got a young team, and they're playing with such tremendous confidence. So their record is the best in the NBA. They're playing like the best team in the NBA. But... Are they really? And, and the numbers may show it. The problem is with them being, they're the team to beat in the East. And I said that even with the Gordon Hayward trade. They're the team to beat in the East. The problem is, to be the best team in the NBA, you've got to beat Golden State four times out of seven. That will be tough to do. I think they can do it. It'll just be very, very difficult. And we'll see what ends up happening in a couple of weeks. Uh, again, we love you guys. We thank you guys so much for being a big supporter of us all. Don't forget to submit your questions uh, in a multitude of ways. One last one here. Um, with uh, This is from Eric in Texas. With the NASCAR season coming to a close and Dale Earnhardt Jr. retiring, how will you remember and who is the new face of NASCAR? Well, listen, uh, you know, Sunday was kind of, um, it was interesting for me. You're watching the championship race, uh, and then you know it's a winner-take-all, and, and Martin Truex Jr. was tremendous and did such a great job to win the championship. And the moment with him and Dale Jr. was great um, in the winner's circle. Uh, and Jr. retiring now, 26 wins, never a championship, but a two-time Daytona 500 winner, Um it was kind of one of those interesting nights. You're celebrating Martin Truex Jr. with his championship and everything that he's gone through in his career. Um, and now to try to celebrate the career of Dale Earnhardt Jr. as well, it uh, it, it was pretty cool to watch and pretty cool to see. Um, for Truex to get that victory, it's it's great. And now you look at this. Um, when Truex won championships uh, in the Xfinity Series, uh, a team that was owned by Junior, by Dale Earnhardt, in 04 and 05, that was kind of cool to see them celebrate together. Um, but that being said, you know, I my very first NASCAR race, I, I shouldn't say that the first one that I watched, my very first Daytona 500 that I watched 
was the day Dale Sr. died. Um, And in that moment, I became a junior fan. I think a lot of people did uh, because you saw the emotion of him and and you just wondered how terrible it was to, to lose your father doing something that both of you loved. And Junior has been around the sport ever since he was a kid, and he's going to stay around the sport, obviously, as a broadcaster. But um, it was kind of surreal to watch his career end because as beloved as he's been, he's never won a championship. And I'm not trying to knock him, but he's been voted 14 times the most popular driver in NASCAR. He, two-time Daytona 500 winner, uh, 26 wins as a racer in general. But more importantly, he's just been a good person, a quality human. And that is what has made him so popular. He's always taken time out for the fans, um, has always allowed fans to be a part of his life. Um, and he's always thought of other people. And he's always, you know, been that guy to kind of raise other people up. And he did that on Sunday, congratulating Truex Um making special note of the people who have supported him, his wife, Amy, and everybody else. And you look at who the sport, and, and I don't know, Mike, um, uh, uh, excuse me, Eric, I don't know who becomes the face of NASCAR now. You've got a number of guys, but you look at who we've lost uh, over the last couple of years. I shouldn't say lost, retired over the last couple of years. Jeff Gordon, Tony Stewart, um, you know, Danica Patrick as you know, you can say what you want about her career, but she was always a, a face uh, of the sport and now junior it's it's going to be interesting to see um you've got a lot of interesting people to look at obviously the bush brothers um kyle and kurt are going to be up there brad keselowski is going to be another one who is just so uh polarizing i guess would probably be the best way to put it and then i think the one that might step up the most and make things big there for everybody is, is Joey Logano. Joey Logano uh, is a guy who I've been following a little bit for a few years, and I think he's got the ability to take that next leap and become that face uh, of NASCAR. Along with Kislowski, uh Jimmy Johnson obviously is still going to be there uh, and still going to attempt to break the record for and get an eighth championship. So those probably three, JJ, um, Kislowski, and Logano are probably the three that I think become the face, whether they become the most popular driver, who knows? I think Jimmy Johnson is that guy, but uh, we'll see. All all I know is that Sunday was definitely surreal uh, to watch Dale Jr. in his final race and uh, and knowing that uh, a guy who has just lived and breathed stock car racing for so long is is uh, is not going to be there anymore. But uh, as always, guys, we appreciate your your questions. We thank you guys so much for for making us one of the fastest growing sports podcasts in the country. Uh, We hope you continue to do that by supporting us on social media, Press Row Podcast dash Public House Media on Facebook, Press Row PHM on Twitter and Instagram. You can always email us, PressRowPHM at gmail.com. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, and of course, the website, thephmedia.com. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you so much for making us a part of your weekend. Enjoy the food, enjoy the football, but most importantly, enjoy the family. And until next week, I will see you on Press Row.